My name is Scott Drossis. First of all, thank you very much for coming to the machine learning and uh, predictive analytics or data analytics uh, <clears throat> session, introduction to, the, to those topics. If you're here for the advanced cooking class, then you're in the wrong session. Um, but uh, my name is Scott Drossis. I'm president of Infinity, uh, Infinity Consulting. Um, we are co-sponsors with uh, NetApp. Dave Pizzo, who's in the front row here, uh, is with, uh, with NetApp, um, great providers of data storage um, technologies. and. Um, we've teamed together on this presentation, which in one way or another we're dealing with data, and, uh, and so we hope you enjoy it. To my right is uh, John Gray, uh, Chief Technology Officer of uh, Infinity uh, and founder, co-founder. And Harsha, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name, um, Harsha, it's a long, I think it's got 14 characters in it. Uh, and Harsha is the uh, CEO of Sevu, um, and his partner announced this up front as well. And uh, they are data scientists who've got about a dozen years of uh, data science, multiple years of data science experience and lots of different uh, data science and machine learning projects. And they've exclusively partnered <laughs> with us for, um, for doing machine learning and data analytics work. So we're delighted to uh, uh, collectively bring this presentation to you today. Um, so uh, before we uh, get going into the content, um, we're just going to do a quick overview uh, and, or some background around uh, machine learning and predictive analytics. I'll just kind of do a quick walkthrough, a little bit about us. And then John's going to guide you through uh, an actual real life example and hopefully uh, impart uh, with you uh, a sense of how to go about doing a machine learning project, uh, a data science initiative. Just by show of hands, how many in the room have actually conducted a machine learning project themselves? Anybody? One, there's, you don't have to be shy. You can hold your hand right up. Um, <clears throat> how many are uh, thinking about it right now? Okay. So I'm going to assume the rest of you are here out of curiosity and, uh, and are pretty nascent uh, in terms of your understanding of it. So we'll try to kind of keep the information sharing uh, in that context. Uh, then as we uh, move from the actual real-life example of a project uh, that we've uh, done and conducted, We'll move into a, a short panel session, and we can stay longer if you decide you want us to answer more questions, but we are slotted to end at uh, 2.45. So, a little bit about us first of all. Um, Infinity is a uh, public sector organization. We're Sacramento-based, founded in 2004. We uh, really are focused exclusively, <coughs> excuse me, pretty much on public sector, um, state and local government, education, healthcare. And, um, and we focus on bringing technology, people, and process together to help make a difference and pride ourselves on helping deliver um, uh, projects on time and on budget. Uh, a lot of different logos of who we work with, um, just to reinforce our, our history here and also our, our commitment to public sector in California. So uh, <clears throat> machine learning and predictive analytics. Um, a lot of folks focus on the tools. and. You know, when you're first contemplating it, you can get wrapped up in understanding what you need to get going, and that's fair, that's fine. But um, really, the, uh, the, the more difficult part of the task is uh, trying to understand how you might use them and use them effectively. And so um, what, one of the things that we, you know, expression we like to use is you focus more on the I uh, than the T in IT. And when it comes to machine learning and data analytics, data analytics, because really uh, it is all about the information. And as uh, if you're in an IT department, in an IT department, you tend to historically focus a lot on the technology, the infrastructure, the, <coughs> the deployment of that technology, um, less so maybe on the use of the knowledge or use of the, uh, of the information. And uh, what you're going to hear today is a lot of focus on how to use that data. So um, a lot of this work tends to typically start with an idea or a notion or a sense that there's something going on in my organization, whatever that might be. Um, it could be in the case that we're going to share with you, which it'll be anonymized data, by the way. We can't share exactly who it is, but you know, they had an idea that there was a, something that they wanted to improve on. They didn't know exactly what or how, but they can, the data and analytics uh, process allows you to kind of drill in and get at that. Then you're able to um, uh, generate hypotheses, identify relevant data, and conduct experiments uh, through that process. 
And then lastly, it, it allows for discovery and, and ideally continued discovery because once you start to understand what your data is telling you, you often want to go back and continue to revisit that. Uh, we've got this uh, predictive analytics process that we follow um, that has this, uh, you know, it really would maybe be better to show it as a, as a circle because it's kind of circular in terms of how you go about um, uh, conducting the use of it or following this process. Um, so the first thing is trying to define your problem. So that could be that notion, but really what is it that you're trying to understand? And then moving into an analysis uh, mode and um, trying to uh, look for the data that you're going to use, uh, evaluate and define the problem. And then uh, from there, you tend to want to move into an actual uh, checking of the data, cleansing of the data. Um, and you know, sometimes you may realize you don't even have the data you need that you want, uh, to accomplish what you want to accomplish. So there's a whole process there of um, understanding you know, what data do you have, <coughs> is the data clean? And, um, and then you move into a, a process of validating and fine tuning uh, the data, which uh, leads us to a set of predictions, right? Some findings, some learnings. And, um, and then from that, we move back into the discovery mode. So that's what I meant by a circular process. And the part in the, the second to fourth um, sections or steps um, get quite circular, uh, even within a single project. Um, so real, just uh, high level, some popular machine learning use cases. Uh, a very popular one is fraud in government as well as commercially. Um, so trying to understand um, you know, where are the, what are the bad guys trying to do to my, to my data, to my system? And uh, we can actually achieve a lot uh, through good predictive analytics and machine learning tools. Uh, we can also look at improving our operations and a whole host of other things. So with that, I'm going to pass it to John, and he's going to go deeper, and that just hopefully gives you a little bit of an outline for the session. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, um... Exciting times, if you're a geek like I am. I mean, I took a computer science degree over three decades ago, and one of the things, the areas of that that I was very interested in at the time was artificial intelligence. And over the decades since then, not that much has happened with AI until recently. So machine learning is an implementation of artificial intelligence, finally. You know, now we've got the compute power and the you know, masses of storage, we can finally start to apply these algorithms that have been around for quite a long time. So as excited as I am about new technology, where I pretty quickly get to is, OK, how do we apply that? How are we going to do a project? You know, what kind of people do we need? What kind of tools? You know, what are the deliverables? You know, how do we deal with the client? How do we interact? Those types of things. So what I'm going to talk about here is a small project, kind of a starter uh, machine learning project that we have recently finished for a client. So I'll step you through the different areas that the different areas of that project through the problem statement, the objective, the tasks, the tools and environments, the deliverables, the roles, and then the talk about the schedule and the duration. So the problem statement, we have, we've anon uh, anonymized this, um, so we're not talking about the actual client, but they are a California public sector client. They have millions of users who apply online, right? And at the end of the application process, which is a very long application process, they collect survey information. So the fairly standard, you know, from very positive to very negative feedback, along with text that people enter into a blob of text, basically. So what they want, although they get primarily positive feedback, they do get negative feedback. So what they wanted to do was analyze that feedback to figure out how can they improve their application process, right? So given they've got millions of these records, this hundreds of thousands, right? So you're not going to be able to read through those all to spot trends and do those kinds of things. So this is where machine learning comes in. So the objective of the project was to perform text processing analysis, do uh, clustering, which is something I'll explain a little bit and a little bit further along on the survey comments from the dissatisfied users to figure out which parts of the application process could be improved and how to do that. Um, like I said, this is very much first project for this client. They've got about another half a dozen machine learning projects that they want us to do, which are significantly bigger, involve things like fraud, and will have you know significant higher benefits coming back. So Scott went over this. I mean, you know, we're uh, already a little bit, you know, as a good consultant and a good IT guy, you've got to have a fancy, you know, flow, right? Some good icons and whatever that you use. But basically, here's the process, right? Define the problem, analyze the data, perform ETL, 
look at predictions and outcomes all the way through to going back around again, discovering other opportunities. So like any methodology, right, you start out with what is your, your guideline, your checklist methodology. You look at the problem, the project you've got at hand, and you figure out which parts of this do we need to use, right? So this is where um, our data scientists on the team, Harsha and Anand, you know, used some of their expertise to look at the problem and then figure out which parts of this do we really need for this particular project. So what we came up with was using something called sentiment analysis uh, as one of the steps, right, to figure out and gain insight into the text as to the things that were negative about it, right? And then we produce something called a word cloud, right, which is another kind of machine learning model that identifies which words are most common, you know, which are most prevalent in the negative text. Uh, clustering then is this sort of unguided machine learning technique that can come up with things that really you didn't expect, right, that group things together to, to provide you more information. And then temporal analysis is a, is a fancy way of saying looking at results over time, right? So are there things that happened at a certain point in time that were particularly bad? You get a big spike. Can you relate that to an event either in the world or in the customer's environment? So I will now kind of step through each of these um, and not only talk about the steps that were involved, but the actual results we got. So sentiment analysis. Um, our data scientists selected a couple of different models here. Logistic regression and naive bays are a couple of different models they use because they're particularly suited to this type of um, this type of textual analysis, the sort of medium size of data that we had in this situation. Uh, and they found that the logistic regression performed better, which was actually a bit of a surprise because I think it was the one they were they were expecting naive bays to work more effectively. Uh, and then out of that we got various classification scores. And I will not try and explain these. I'll have my friend here, Harsha, give you a bit more information about what all this means. But we have to go there to speak, so. OK, come on up. Yeah. Oh, you, yeah, you can speak here, though, too. Oh, you can? Yeah. Oh, OK. It's OK, stay here, though. You're up now. Yeah. All right, I'm out. Okay. <laughs> so yes, uh, as John was saying, um, these are two popular models we use for text because uh, they tend to work well when there's not that much of feature dependence, where there is a lot of uh, in the data and text is very well suited for that. Uh, Nile base uh, is mostly used, and in a smaller data set, we would have definitely, we are pretty sure that Nile base would have performed much better. But the medium sized data set, I think, gave logistic regression some room to catch up. And I think, yes, he's nodding ahead. Yeah. Uh, what are the parents? So, all the numbers there are uh, ways for us. You know, you can't look at just one, any one metric. It doesn't give the whole picture. Like accuracy is uh, is the predominant metric. Out of all the all the predictions you did, what percentage of them were right? Right. That's the basic metric. But you could easily skew accuracy to a very high without really solving the problem. So so the next num next set of uh, metrics you see precision recall. And F score, F score is just a harmonic mean of precision and recall. So we, these are this is basically what is called a, a confusion matrix. This is the output of the precision and recall, or it's just mathematical equations from that, uh, which which talks about uh, how many how many selector how many items you out of all the relevant items, how many were you selected were relevant. That is precision. And uh, recall talks about, it's another way of looking at it. It, it talks about uh, how many relevant items did you really select. Uh, so with this, uh, I think gives a much better picture of which model is better. And uh, as you can see, the sentiment correlates very well with the user provided rating. So by that, you mean that the, the model found that the the negative sentiment in the text related to the box they checked as far as whether it yeah. was good point. negative. Yeah, so what happened was, with along with the text, the users have also provided ratings. Did they really, you know, mm -hmm. how, how much they liked it from a one to five? So we could really see that the sentiment really correlated pretty good with what ratings they'd given. So, I mean, these are some of the words and phrases that it identified right coming out of things like convoluted, not user-friendly, dissatisfied, um, you know, 
kinds of things you might expect, yeah. right, as being negative. So this is you know, part of the analysis. Also, to I think to really understand that the model was working effectively, you also identify positive analysis, right, which comes up with words like not complicated, enjoyed. So that's another way of gauging that the model was working effectively. Um, so after doing sentiment analysis, the next area was generating the word card which um, generate keywords that dominate the negative comments. And this starts to drive towards perhaps, you know, what are the themes and the areas in this that would tell us which part of the application really was the problem? Because as I say, there were many, many pages in this application process. So then there's certain things, steps you have to go through, stemming, removing common words, spell check, before this particular kind of modeling can be done. Uh, then here is a sort of representation of the output of that. Words like application, well, yeah, that was everywhere, but it doesn't really help us understand what was wrong. But then sexual orientation, there was part of the application process that was asking about people's sexual or orientation. And clearly there was some frustration around that area. Uh, website, time consuming, personal information, other words that came up that started to give us an idea of the areas of the application process that were problematic. Um, so, yeah, so the, hi the highlighted uh, sections also are what the customer really wanted us to focus on mm -hmm. was to identify broad themes that were problematic that they could act on. Right. So that yeah. was that was uh, reflective of the idea of they had a notion of, of an issue, right? And so those reinforced their, their notion. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, Moving on um, from the word cloud, clustering was the next technique that was used, which was to group, you apply a model that would group different terms together in the frequency they were used. Um, and well, here's one point, you know, there's text pre-processing that is required, but text has to be converted to numbers, right, for machine learning algorithms to work, because they, they work numerically. Uh, a lot of it is very mathematical, as you can tell, you know, Harsha has a deep mathematical background, so a lot of people coming into data science these days may be more from a software background, but the people who are really good at this, from what I found, have deep mathematical background because the formulas and the algorithms require a lot of math to understand how to apply them and tune them. So um, in this area, we've run something called k-means for uh, so cluster things together um, and identifying the key words that were grouped. So, and then analyzing the output, tuning and iterating. Um, and I'll show you some of the results here and then I'll let Harsha explain a little more. So, you know, there was a grouping of words, like time consuming, <coughs> logging, wasting time, kept logging out, you know, things like this, that pointed the theme here is potential website issues. So overall website issues, right? They are having timeouts, that sort of thing. Um, School, personal, sexual, high, high school orientation, areas of personal information. This is an area that, like we were saying, the, the client had a hunch that this was a problematic area for people or they were you know, getting annoyed by it. And this really drove home that this was part of the application process that they're going to completely revisit. Uh, you know, the client, you know, say, is, was very excited by the output of, from this project. So it, I think, to some degree, really sort of uh, drove home points where they had they had hunches and also gave them some completely different information. They, you know, they didn't know they had so many performance problems and that those were you know, such a factor. So uh, a lot of trends here that really uh, helped identify where the dissatisfaction was. So I don't know, Harsha, if you've got more to explain the, the ins and outs of clustering. Yeah, I, I think uh, John hit on most of these. Okay, so I got it right this time. <laughs> So, uh, one thing we'd say is, as part of the model development, we do a lot of tuning, we, we change various parameters. Like clustering, um, one of the things we do is we, we change uh, how many clusters we wanted, we'll, we'll try different uh, cluster sizes that we want, just to see how what themes we, we pick up. And uh, it's kind of a little bit of an iterative process at, at that point. And, I think with five clusters, we got, uh, even in five, you could see that a couple of them didn't have real clear themes. But while talking to the customer, funny enough, they said, hey, one of these does actually have a theme that we didn't realize it because it looked this very one. generic. 
yeah mm -hmm. the college and students look generic enough but uh, the client point out hey that's we have a section in our process which is education and that's probably what it's focused on so while we went in thinking we found personal information and uh, website issues uh, key things we also yeah, out of the meeting we realized that was uh, another theme that was there if uh, harsha if you were um if you had uh in this case hundreds of thousands of written application written um comments and you're trying to uh, sort through them to come up with uh, some of these themes. Are there any other strategies? Um, it would be very difficult without clustering to try to work through that volume of data, right? Yeah. So for this particular problem, yeah, it's the, like uh, John pointed out, it's called an unsupervised learning because we do not know what, what we are expecting, right? So that's the technique, and clustering is one of the popular algorithms for that. There are other models we could have used. Just out of curiosity, so for clustering and for the um, work cloud, do you also run those against the positive responses just to get a we, level or something? Good question. We could, but for this particular example, we didn't because uh, us, us in sentiment analysis where we, we have to use both positive and negative to get a result, uh, word cloud and clustering, if we mix positive and uh, negative comments, yeah, the, the, the answer wouldn't be would be kind of muddled. Sure. So if you wanted to do positive, you'll have to do positive separately and then negative separately. And in this case, the client um, specifically was interested in the negative analysis. They were felt that they had a handle on their positive analysis or their positive comments. So, um, OK, yeah, so the temporal analysis. Show there was a big spike in negative comments back in 2014. I think that related to a rollout of a new version of the application that. Yeah, didn't work so well. Um, so yeah, I don't think that necessarily was a big surprise, but it reinforced yeah the information they got at that point. Um, okay, so tools and environment, right? Yeah, if you've looked at big data, predictive analytics, machine learning, there are a lot of tools now, right? There are a lot of open source libraries. Everything um, we use. Um, is I think open source, right? There's no proprietary um, languages or, or products that we use here. It's really, as you can tell, it's it's kind of the, the key is the understanding of which tool to use for which problem and then how to tune those tools, how to you know relate to the client and what they're looking for, right? And get that into into how you set the tool up. Um, so there are libraries. Um, and some of the you know languages like Perl is a more of a general purpose language, but some of these libraries and languages are very specific to machine learning. Um, there are infrastructure, you know, Apache, Spark, and Hadoop, uh, you know, big data kind of um, bit ecosystem that now have quite a lot of machine learning components within them. Uh, and then you get to kind of underlying in infrastructure like NetApp has you know extremely fast storage, both on-premise and hybrid cloud. Uh, that w it works very well when you've got very large data sets and you, you, know, you need screaming fast storage. So, I mean, to the point that we can do this kind of work equally well either on-premise, hybrid cloud, or in the cloud. Um, so, uh, we, it really it doesn't matter that much. Um, if you get up into huge volumes of data, the, obviously, you know, the environment becomes more important on how you tune it. Uh, there are very specialized tools, and then there are general purpose tools like, if I'm using the point here, like Excel, right? Everybody likes to look at data in Excel. So still some of those apply, depending on how the users want to consume the data. Um, I don't know, Tasha, is there anything else that you, you want to make as far as the sort of the landscape of tools? We didn't use all these on this project, but this is, if you're starting out, right, this is the you know kind of the gamut of tools that you have available. Yeah, I think the only thing we'll emphasize is on the open source. Uh, today, open source uh, machine learning libraries and tools are so much more powerful, and all even companies like Google and Facebook are constantly adding to the open mm -hmm. source whatever the internal research they do. So we believe uh, open source it's also you know is the way to go. It also keeps the cost low for our customers with providing state-of-the-art uh, technology. Yeah, and I mean, this area is changing rapidly. I mean, relentless change. So having people who have the skill sets, you know, like uh, data scientists here, uh, who keep up with this, you know, 
month in and month out is very important. You know, the, for example, the trans, you know, kind of the transition from Hadoop to Spark being the more common or the more powerful ecosystem in the big data analytics area. Uh, you know, these things can, can come and go, you know, pretty quickly. So, on this particular project, um, we just, you know, we chose to use an AWS environment, secure environment, because the data was sensitive, so everything had to be encrypted, um, you know, at rest and in transit. So we built an AWS environment. Python and uh, natural language toolkit package was um, chosen to be used for processing the, the text, and then an open source machine learning tools, Python, and the scikit learn package. So a relatively small, you know, set of tools because this was a, you know, relatively small project. 